Happy Sunday. <laughs> Did you know that that song has lyrics? And the lyrics is, they, they're, um, it's called uh, Bunny, and it's it goes, Bunny, 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 bun, 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 bun. Those are the actual lyrics for that, just so you know, historically. <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know that, and I'm the one who wrote it. <laughs> well, I'm the lyricist. You are. Robert is the composer of the music. 30 minutes after that little scratch piece of music, which we still haven't replaced as our opening theme, and I find out there were lyrics to it. Well, happy Sunday, friends, lovers. It is July 19th, 2020, and this is 5 Minutes with Robert Naser. I am here with my co-host, Amy Naser, and all of you, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Andrea and Bonnie, thank you so much. And especially Andrea, Bonnie, and everybody in the chat. Yes. As always, we count on your feedback, questions, answers, suggestions, insults, whatever it takes to keep the show going. Yes. Today is July 19th, 2020, mm -hmm. the 201st day of this interesting year. Super interesting year. It'd be so boring without 2020. Life would just be kind of, you know, blah. <laughs> Life would be just kind of possible. <laughs> but anyway, there are 159 days until Christmas or 104 days until Halloween. Yay! And speaking of which, you know, Amy is doing a secret summertime Halloween exchange. If you're yes. one of those Halloween people that I keep putting Halloween stats in the show opening for. You know who you are. You know who you are. You need to hit Amy up on Facebook. Yes, hit me up on Facebook, PM me your address, I shall do a wonderful spooky Halloween basket exchange with you. God only knows what's coming, and he ain't telling. <laughs> yeah, for me, um, my preference for a Halloween basket would be the weirder the better. So that's, I need to look that up in Latin and use that as my insignia. The weirder the better? The weirder the better. And yeah, in, so... In creo weirdum el betterum. <laughs> I'm sure that's what it is. That's what it is. And um, for those who who also you might not know, I'm also I also have uh, what one little sweet little girl who I'm going to be exchanging Halloween baskets with, and so it's not just for adults. Just let me know, and we'll do it. We'll get it Super done, sweet. and it'll be so exciting because Halloween. Amy up on Facebook. Halloween is the best. She's your Halloween person. Yes. El El Halloweeno del del. Uh, weirdom. <laughs> do, you, do you question my flaccidity with languages? No. That's right. I'm sure that's absolutely perfect. And on this day, <laughs> July 19th, <laughs> in 1799, during Napoleon Bonaparte's Egyptian campaign, a French soldier discovered a 1,680-pound black stone slab inscribed with ancient writing near the town of... Rosetta, oh. about 35 miles east of Alexandria. Oh, wow. The irregularly shaped stone contained fragments of passages written in three different scripts, Greek, Egyptian hieroglyphics, mm -hmm. and the Egyptian Demotic languages. Nice. The ancient Greek of the Rosetta Stone told archaeologists that it was inscribed by priests honoring the king of Egypt, Ptolemy V, in the 2nd century B.C., more startlingly, the Greek passage announced that the three scripts were all of identical meaning. Wow. The artifact thus held the key to solving the riddle of hieroglyphics, a written language that had been dead for nearly 2,000 years. So now you know the story behind the Rosetta Stone. More details in the show notes. It's very interesting. Also, mm -hmm. happy 206th birthday to mm -hmm. Samuel Colt. Yes. Born on this day, July 19th, in 1814. Pew, pew. Pew, pew. He <laughs> founded the Colts Patent Firearms Manufacturing Company and had countless patents, patents and firearm inventions. Nice. Created the mass production of the revolver, most notably the 45 caliber Peacemaker model. <clears throat> the company was founded in 1855, 165 years ago. So, happy birthday, Mr. Colt wherever ye may lay. Mm. And last but not least, today is National Ice Cream Day. Thanks to is President it? Ronald Reagan, we celebrate National Ice Cream Day the third Sunday in July. 
meaning today, July 19th this year. Was this favorite ice cream jelly bean flavored ice cream? I don't remember. (laughs) I I bet it is. Commenters, tell us what Ronald Reagan's favorite ice cream was. In 1984, Ronald Reagan decreed a day for ice cream, and his proclamation actually (laughs) glorified the dairy industry in America. I hereby declare. Now, mm. if I remember right, we already had chocolate ice cream day earlier this year. Yeah, I think we did. So I'm a little suspicious about some of those holidays. But if Ronald Reagan made that, that's pretty official. Yes. And 1984. So, you know, 36 <laughs> years ago, that's got some staying power. Any <laughs> reason to eat ice cream is a good reason to eat ice cream. Good. So yeah. what are we listening to this week? This morning, I listened to... Jean Maroney Binswanger. Wow. She's, on Harry Binswanger's Harry Binswanger letter site. She's a pretty sharp lady. Oh, she's wicked smart. And if you're not already subscribed to the Harry Binswanger letter, the Harry Binswanger list, the forum mm-hmm. that he keeps, you you want this in the notes, how to do that, or in the show notes. Nice. This morning she was discussing willpower. And um, yeah. her topic was willpower rational and irrational uses. Now, listeners to our show will recognize that we've discussed will and choice and focus. Mm -hmm. Jean Maroney Binswanger's insights are outstanding. I won't tell you all of them because you're supposed to pay for that stuff. But from my notes, she makes the distinction between focus and will, or focus and willpower. Good. And one of her takeaways, because will is limited, whereas focus is axiomatic, is you should use willpower only to overcome inertia, but not to overcome resistance. And the reason is, if you will yourself through resistance, Mm -hmm. you're willing yourself through something that, somewhere psychologically, you are telling yourself you don't want to do this thing. So you have an inner conflict. You have an inner conflict. And by using will to get through it, Uh, not only do you deplete your... Supply of willpower, Mm -hmm. but you give yourself future reasons to resist even further. Well, that's sort of uh, similar to repression, right? It's related. Yep. It's absolutely related. Yes. So that was outstanding. Yeah, she defines willpower as the ability to call upon your own energy to initiate an action. Okay. Absolutely worth hearing. Uh, On HBL, on the Harry Binswanger letter, once a week, Besides all the written posts that go back and forth and are really the meat of the service, Mm -hmm. they have a a once-a-week meeting of the minds. Mm -hmm. And they get together on Zoom, and we're talking 30, 40, 50 of the smartest people, mostly involved in Ayn Rand's philosophy, Mm -hmm. will get together, and Harry will give a talk or sometimes have a guest who will be the primary speaker, and then it will be discussed. This was outstanding. It's, it's you know it's a little pricey. It's a subscription. I think it's twelve fifty a month or one hundred and forty dollars a year. Definitely worth signing up to. Also under podcast of the week and what are we listening to, and what got me going on this week's subject, and you'll see how this relates to the HBL and Gene Maroney Binswanger's talk. What I'm listening to is Angela Lee Duckworth's talk, Grit, the Power of Passion and Perseverance. So this was a TED Talk that she gave, but she went on. Of course, if you have a successful TED Talk, you always go on to write a book. So there's also a book available. That's your next step is a successful TED Talk. Robert Nacer. And then the book will sell like hotcakes. Mm -hmm. Like... uh, With syrup and butter. With syrup and butter. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so I've been interested in grit all week. Um, Yeah, and the pancakes can, or hotcakes can have fiber in them as well. (laughs) <laughs> because it's grit. Grit. Oh, grit. Fire. Got it. <laughs> I just had to put that in there somewhere. And who doesn't need more grit in their diet or fiber in their diet? That's right. Everyone does. That's right. Stones and twigs. Eat those stones and twigs. <laughs> so Angela Lee Duckworth defines grit as passion and perseverance. Yeah. Uh, stealing from Wikipedia in psychology, grit is a positive non-cognitive trait. It's interesting, non-cognitive. non-cognitive. Is it axiomatic? Does it come before thought? Well, it is, because we'll think about willpower. Okay. This is the expenditure of energy. It's not mm. that you think yourself into taking the action. Thought is part and parcel, but what's underneath all that is 
expenditure of energy. Mm, okay. So yeah, I can kind of see that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, it may be more clear as we go, or maybe not. Let's see if we can do our job here. Grit is a positive, non-cognitive trait based on an individual's perseverance of effort combined with the passion for a particular long-term goal or end state. So there's an article in Forbes that's mm-hmm. worth reviewing because that'll give us a framework here. Okay. Five Characteristics of Grit by Margaret Great. Perlis. See, according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, grit in the context of behavior is defined as firmness of character, indomitable spirit. That word indomitable never sounds right. Does that sound like a real word? Indomitable. Indomitable. Like you can't be dominated. You cannot be dominated. Domitilated. Im- indomitable. This is what happens when you go with the dictionary definition. you you got to use your own for this stuff. But Merriam-Webster <laughs> says, firmness of character, indomitable spirit. Yes. We know you are indomitable folks out there. Mm-hmm. If you can get from one end of this podcast to the other, you are indomitable. <laughs> and listening cannot be dominated. Eat nails for breakfast, get through the five minutes podcast when it's over five minutes for sure. <laughs> That's right. It's never over five minutes. So Angela Lee Duckworth <laughs> tweaked the definition to be perseverance and passion for long term goals. And here's the five traits Mm -hmm. that um, define grit. All right. Not define grit, that um, explain grit. Okay. So number one is courage. Your ability to manage fear of failure is imperative and a predictor of success. Managing your fear of failure. So if you fail, which you just might, it's okay. You just, you know, you do what's supposed to be done anyway. Yes. Number two, conscientiousness. Okay. This is committing to go for the gold rather than just to show up for practice. That's an interesting distinction. It's an interesting... Conscientiousness, because mm-hmm. the, the, this writer, Perlis, makes the point that grit implies a, a commitment to a certain level of performance. Okay. So you, the person who just shows up for the job five days a week but never excels in performance and does the bare minimum oh, I see. or even a reasonable but uninspired job you wouldn't regard them as having grit absent right. unusual obstacles. Right. This is just somebody getting by. Yeah, but conscientiousness, that's an interesting word to pair that up, that concept with. It is. It is. And that's, I thought that was interesting. interesting. And I think, it's a, I think it's an important part of it. Mm-hmm. Because, again, when we talk about somebody with grit, it's not somebody doing the bare minimum. Right. Or just getting through. Number three, follow through. Now, this is interesting because the writer related it to Malcolm Gladwell's idea of 10,000 hours to excellence. That to achieve ability and ultimately excellence excellence in any reasonably complex task requires 10,000 hours of practice or work or execution. Mm -hmm. Um, So this idea of follow through, of the long-term perspective... Uh, And I think we can relate this to the idea of acting on principle. Yeah. So that you see, even when you don't feel the value, you know the value. And -hmm. sometimes that's enough. Yeah. You know, and if that whole follow through, um, well, we'll we'll get into this a little bit. The the distinction between um, knowing why you're doing what you're doing and why it's a value to, to you versus just... Oh, got to put that 10,000 hours into this kind of as a sense of duty or something. But we can get into that later. Well, I think that's why you want to understand the 10,000 hour perspective. Yeah. It's why it's worth reading Gladwell. Is if you really get that 10,000 hour perspective, then doing that thing acquires a value that it might not have otherwise. If you don't have the sense that, yeah, this is getting me where I want to go, even if I'm not loving it in this moment, Mm -hmm. then you're calling on willpower. The kind of willpower which, per Gene Roney Binswanger's discussion, is limited. Right, or you have to stop and introspect at that point. Mm -hmm. Perhaps remind yourself, yeah, of what that value is. Yes. Mm -hmm. So number four after courage, conscientiousness, and follow-through is resilience. And it's interesting because I thought of this more as toughness, constitution. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the writer also brings in optimism, confidence, and creativity, Mm. which 
to me are more coping mechanisms for improving your resilience. Yeah. But yes, resilience, because 10,000 hours or even 40 hours of any long-term project is going to, are going, is going to, are going to include something going to include. <laughs> yes. <laughs> some degree of stumbling. Grammar, please. See, some degree <laughs> of failure. Sometimes you're going to you know, lose yourself in the middle of a sentence. <laughs> Any substantial effort project is, yeah. there's going to be some degree of failure. And you right. need the resilience to bounce right. back from that and continue on. So that's right. Optimism, confidence, and creativity. You know, I, I was thinking about conscientiousness, and I think that there's a big, a big part of that is creativity. You know, in terms of just not doing the bare minimum of being um, conscientious about, you know, not just doing things accurately or doing them um, exactly the way, they, the way that they need to be, but also, you know, kind of like that work smarter, not harder sort of idea. And that takes creativity, I think. So, yeah, lot, lots, of, lots of concepts to play with. <laughs> well, I think, I think creativity is, is underappreciated in, oh, yeah. in all of these uh, domains of psychology and motivation mm-hmm. and philosophy. Yes, it is. And we talked about that, but you'll talk about it more as we go along. <laughs> I can talk. You being the creative one of this duo. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I can do yeah, something. David things. says conscientious. Con- Conscientiousness. Conscientiousness is a wonderful <laughs> virtue to talk about. And he says, I find it one of my pet virtues, if there is such a thing. Pet I virtues. love that idea of, of, of adopting a given virtue, of, of having a personal connection to it. Yeah. Um, we could take, like, the seven primary virtues that Ayn Rand outlines and say, well, but which one's your favorite? How could you have a favorite? They're all essential. They're all necessary. They all reap enormous rewards if you practice them. Mm-hmm. And yet, I, I look at those seven virtues and say, well, independence. I want to be Howard Rourke. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be a great architect. Right. I just want to know that uh, I occupy um, my particular space in the world, that I operate the way I operate, that I am Robert Nacer, and I'm really jazzed about that fact. Yes. So, one... One more of those five. One more. That's it. Traits from the Forbes article: <laughs> uh, passion for excellence versus per- versus perfection. Perfection. I'm excellence reading. versus perfection. <laughs> excellence versus perfection. Well, we could probably do a whole show on perfectionism mm-hmm. and excellence versus perfectionism. So I thought this was a great insight. And the writer says, in general, gritty people don't seek perfection but instead strive for excellence. How awesome is that? Mm -hmm. Passion for excellence as against perfection. Yep. Yeah, I wrote in the comments, who's a perfectionist? Yes. Raise your hand. (laughs) I should say, who's a procrastinator? Raise your hand. (laughs) Well, I think that we all suffer from that a little bit. Um, Well, well, it's, it's interesting to come up with this topic because people like us shouldn't have issues with this stuff. We should have had this handled years ago. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because in some domains we do, but in other ones we don't. We so we're, don't. we're working on this as much as anybody out there. Yeah, I mean, and I get into that where I'm, I feel, uh, gosh, I mean, I, I get into situations where I'm like, well, no, wait a minute, I got to do this and I got to double check that and I got to do this and I got to double check that. And it gets a little compulsive. And then I stop and think to myself, do I really need to do that? Can't I um, not... I mean, what, what would be the outcome if I just skipped that part? And I'm like, you know what? I think it would work anyway. And I, I've never had a problem with that. I've never actually failed because of that. Hmm. Trying to give myself a little leeway, a little slack. Um, Maybe. Yeah, because I am a very compulsive, um, not compulsive in that way, but, you know, like that, in that kind of feeling um, a compulsion to double check well, triple I w- check. Well, I won't Quadruple speak. Check. I won't speak for you. Yeah. But I can at least say for myself that no matter how good I get at these things, the greater my passion to fail less. Yeah. The less I fail, the greater my passion to fail even less. Does that make sense? Um. Yeah. Good. I think. <laughs> well, the, the better I get, the more I'm not satisfied with how much better I've gotten. 
I see. I mean, so I mean, you can, you can. I mean, if I'm a if I'm a seven on a scale from one to ten, mm -hmm. that next one is far more important to me. Yeah. Than getting from six to seven. Well, I mean, it becomes uh, exponentially um, harder as you keep reaching different, you know, higher levels. Which makes it counterintuitive that it also becomes exponentially more important to make that next step. Mm -hmm. So that's something I need to. I need to work on. And discussions like this, whether they're helping you or not, are certainly helping me. Yeah. Thank you for coming along on that ride. Yeah, thank you guys. And, and you know, I always think in terms of um, sometimes I need to trust myself more than I do because sometimes I, I feel like I'm that 21-year-old woman who is, you know, not, you know, I'm only a, um, a, a few years older than that right now, but sure, no. <laughs> but I feel like I'm like I feel like I'm the, the young version of myself who hasn't gone through all the things that I've gone through and then I underestimate myself and I'm like you know what I can handle these things I can do this and I do it and it works and um, so sometimes you just have to trust yourself um, John says alarm that's platonic idea of perfection that's right that's exactly right <laughs> alarm Philosophy alarm, woo woo. Yes, um, a little fully contextual definition of perfection is a real challenge. Yeah, it is. And John, I'm, uh, I, don't know, I don't know if I should call him out, but John's wicked smart. He should be a public intellectual. <laughs> call him John. John, out. if anybody could give us a fully contextual definition of perfection. Yes. Um, in objectivism, we know that if you are defining perfection as something impossible, you've now got a useless word that's only going to get you into trouble. Yeah. A perfect man, for example, is not a man, say, who never makes mistakes or never gets anything wrong. Mm -hmm. A perfect man is simply a fully virtuous man, a consistent man. He says uh, there is, however, a rational view of perfection. That's right. And John would be just the one to give it to us. Yes. Thank you, John. <laughs> and Cynthia says... Um, the difference between perfectionism and striving for excellence is respect for context. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah, as I say, the, the, yes, you don't want your idea of perfection to be out of context. You don't want it to be unrelated to, to reality, to what people really are and can be. Right. Yes, which is why Aristotle regarded pride as moral ambition. Because that is the state you're striving to achieve. Mm -hmm. Not to be infallible, but simply to have never willfully or neglectfully failed. That's why it's really important to keep your eye on measuring your goals. Because, <laughs> hmm. you know, uh, um, you've got, we've got Roger here who says, um, how much to be or not to be about perseverance. Um, if, I, if, I'm judge, if I'm getting that gist of that... Uh, it's sometimes, you know, you think to yourself, well, how much, um, how much more conscientious or how much more effort or how much more perfection do I need to put into this? And um, the answer to that is, well, what is your end goal? What's your objective? What do you want to achieve? And how closer are you, achieve, are you to achieving it if you, um, you know, keep the same behaviors that you have? So, yeah, I think it's definitely that back and forth, you know, between your, your behavior, your thought, your behavior, and where, you're, where you are with your outcome, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, I recently watched True Grit. I forget, did you watch that with me? I think so. Was that with um, John Wayne? John Wayne, yeah, yes. Yeah, Wallace film. Anything Hal Wallace did is worth watching. Yeah. With, uh, yeah, Kim Darby and Glenn Campbell. Was that the one from the 1960s? 1969. And he's a little older. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I find this notion of grit, of the union of passion and perseverance, mm -hmm. uh, the drive to both conceive a plan and, crucially, to execute it over time. A lot of this flows from our previous discussions on focus mm -hmm. and choice and values and passion. And I'll say right now, this is only the beginning of this discussion. This is part one. We have so much more to talk about. I am hoping to provide, which means I'm hoping to learn, more valuable insights, interesting and useful. I hope I can provide some right away, and I hope this conversation is useful. But there will be much more coming as I continue this investigation. I was reading uh, William James' hmm. The Energies of Men. <laughs> William James, 1906. I need, I need to read him because I've heard so much about him. 
a lot of bad things. <laughs> a lot but, of he's he's one of those folks who's so smart. Yeah. That you you really want to harvest his insights mm -hmm. without getting too caught up in his overall uh, philosophy and psychology. Right. Kind of like listening to Sam Harris. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, William James also wondered about the difference in grit between people oh. and what is the difference that makes the difference he called for an examination of that and I don't know how far he got or his contemporaries got with it but I absolutely intend to find out more now, yeah. he's he's the one who uh, was a uh, pragmatist pragmatist he is known for pragmatism kind of thing and he was an explicit pragmatist mm -hmm. um, and I say that because there are people who are pragmatic Mm -hmm. And we can criticize them for that, whereas James made a paradigm out of it. Yeah. So in some ways he was better, and in some ways he was worse than a modern pragmatist. I see. But yeah, that actually goes back to your original definition of perseverance, um, or grit, um, mm -hmm. in terms of it being a long-term um, plan of action or consistent behavior. Yes. Yeah. Yes, perseverance and passion. Oh, and for those who don't know, uh, pragmatism in philosophy and in um, you know all the with you know when all the intellectuals and the elite elites get together and they talk about things, they 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 don't think in terms of pragmatism as being the you know being practical. Um, they think of pragmatism as um, the end justifies the means, whatever it takes yes. to get it done. When Let's we, not when, think about the, sh the long term of it. Yes, when we say practical on this show, we're not talking about just practical. We're yeah. talking unprincipled. Right. Or short term thought. Short term, out of context. Yeah. Uh, whatever it takes to get away with the thing. Yeah. As against acting on principle. Because like, around here we know principles are practical. Like Bill Clinton was a pragmatist or is a pragmatist. I don't know, something like that, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm trying to think of a, a president we've had that wasn't a pragmatist. That's true. I mean, obviously some were substantially more principled than others. I'm a big fat fan of Calvin Coolidge, but that was 100 years ago. Yeah, that's, that's having to go back a little ways. <laughs> He was he was a principled man. Yeah, it's tough to talk about it that way because it's hard yep. to say more principled. It's mm -hmm. in some sense you're either principled or you're not. You're pregnant or you're not pregnant. You're pregnant or you're not. It's it yeah. looks like capitalism, for example. Mm -hmm. We champion capitalism on this Yay. show, but champion, championing championing capitalism is a challenge because people think capitalism means pro business, mm -hmm. whereas we mean capitalism in the sense of complete separation of state and economics. You know, in other words, political, economic freedom. So people who champion capitalism often very quickly say, well, there's never been real capitalism. We've never had capitalism. What we have now isn't capitalism. In fact, I think they spend too much time on that, and they should spend more time explaining, well, to the degree we have had political economic freedom, to the degree that we have practiced some degree of capitalism, we've had success. But that would be a whole different show. In any event, when we talk about pragmatism, yes, we're not just meaning practical, we're meaning short-term, out-of-context, unprincipled. And it is possible to be principled and practical. In fact, it's ideal to be principled and practical. Mm -hmm. I have to say real quick, and, yeah. and you saw this too on YouTube, uh, Bonnie, who's amazing. And Bonnie, Bonnie, like John, is somebody who takes concepts seriously very very seriously um, yes and and makes me feel like a bit of an intellectual <laughs> schlub she's so she's so good that way she, she's always taking notes she's she, always just being very careful she's so committed and, to understanding especially epistemology yeah. um, her own uh, ability to achieve knowledge and, and reliable knowledge yes and go bonnie amazing but anyway Bonnie mentions that Jean Maroney Binswanger has a free webinar. I've mentioned yeah. this in past episodes when she was the podcast of the week. Um, absolutely follow the links that will be in the show notes after the show. If you're not on her mailing list yet, her weekly mailing list is outstanding. Free content every week, a short essay, doesn't take much to get through, but always valuable. And you can look into signing up if you're interested in spending a little time and money. Uh, her thinking directions programs 
Mm -hmm. um, and, and the other materials that she's got out there. Yep. So thanks, Bonnie, for reminding me so, to remind all of you. Yes. Thank you, Bonnie. And, and Robert has a big, big book, a big, really thick, heavy-looking book in front of him right now. It's entirely coincidental that I'm holding a copy of <laughs> The Objectivist Forum. Yeah. Uh, which was a newsletter that Harry Binswanger put out. Oh, we just mentioned Harry Binswanger. In fact, yeah. the current edition of this is currently published by HBO Publications. And completely coincidentally, because as I was going through this idea of grit and persistence and the person who sticks with it and gets it done, I was reminded of Ayn Rand's article in the 1960s in Cosmopolitan magazine back oh. when that was still a legitimate magazine. Yeah. And not just uh, 20 articles about how to have a better O. <laughs> or, um, or, or 20 ways to get your man to like you. <laughs> yeah, well, like is the <laughs> understatement. But there's an article that was published back in the 1960s in, in Cosmo mm -hmm. from Ayn Rand called The Money-Making Personality. Oh, nice. Uh, yes. I'll put a link into this. Um, there's not a written version out there on the internet, but the audio version of her reading the essay is out there. And uh, the written version, you can either, you can still find back issues of Cosmo on Amazon for 20 or 30 bucks. Or you can order the Objectivist Forum, where it was reprinted. You should have a copy of this. It's mm -hmm. a great, great. Uh, it's all of the articles from the, the newsletter through the 1980s. The article, The Money-Making Personality, explains the difference between that personality of somebody who produces, mm -hmm. who creates, who makes things happen, and consequently makes money, as opposed to the money-making personality, as opposed to what Rand calls the money appropriator. Mm. The person who just gets money, but never produces or yeah. never never generates value. Right. And it's a long article, and I'm not going to get into everything about that. But toward the end of the right l article, she mentions um, Collis P. Huntington, one of the builders of the Central Pacific Railroad, a man of gigantic ability, but mixed premises. He had the soul of a moneymaker, but resorted at times to the methods of the money appropriators. He made a startling change in his manner of living. He had lived his life in Spartan austerity, contemptuous of all material luxuries and frivolities. But in his 60s, he turned to a sudden frantic orgy of extravagance, indiscriminately buying palatial residences, French furniture, real works of art, and costly trash. The sort of things he had condemned his partners for buying. Among these haphazard acquisitions, there was a painting depicting an ancient scene for which he had paid $25,000, a lot of money back then, an action that seemed incomprehensible to his contemporaries. But here is what Huntington wrote about that painting in his autobiographical notes. Mm -hmm. So this is quoting Huntington. There are seven figures in it three cardinals of the different orders of their religion. There is an old missionary that has just returned. He is showing his scars where his hands are cut all over. He is telling a story to these cardinals. They are dressed in luxury. One of them is playing with a dog. One is asleep. There is only one looking at him, looking at him with that kind of expression saying, what a fool you are that you should go out and suffer for the human race mm -hmm. when we have such a good time at home. I lose the picture in the story when I look at it. I sometimes sit half an hour looking at that picture. Unquote. Then Ayn Rand uh, goes on. What story was Huntington seeing? He was seeing a lonely, unappreciated fighter. He was seeing the moneymaker, mm -hmm. the fighter for man's survival in the jungle of inanimate matter. The man who alone remembers that the world's work has to be done. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when I find myself challenged for motivation, I remember that expression, the world's work must be done. And I find that enormously motivating. Nice. So everybody out there who does an honest day's work, well, yeah. whether it's in a factory, in a restaurant, in an office building, 
as a manager or as a line worker, as a CEO, as a waitress. An honest day's work. Yes. That is what keeps the wheels of the world turning. You know, I, I kind of wonder, so in that story, I wonder how it all ends. What happens to the to the man who does all the work and what happens to the cardinals lazing about, petting dogs and taking naps and well, sneering at the What would you think happens the, the in person? reality? Well... My guess would be the cardinals enjoy their, their listless lives of luxury on a very surface level. Yeah. And are, and are miserable yes, underneath. Yes, yes. And the hardworking man, one hopes, finds his self-esteem and has a real peace of spirit. Right. Because that's certainly what I see in the people I know in real life. Yes. And one would hope that um, the the man who the hardworking man doesn't support in any way these people who are lazing about in misery. Um, well, to the extent that we can't help doing that, mm-hmm. whether it's through family obligations or the government and taxes or all of the other ways in which your your spirit can be tapped into by others mm-hmm. hopefully we can minimize that and then not focus so much on it Cynthia says um, I think in reply to the, the, the hard-working man you built that Yes. As a as a way of expressing encouragement and um, yes, well, it's, it's obviously a reply to, to those who would proud. say you didn't build that. Right. Yes. Don't tell. Don't don't let people tell you that you didn't build that. Yes. Oh, we're all living in a, um, you know, uh, okay. collective uh, collective consciousness. Uh, you know, in a village when when we're all you know. <laughs> doing our doing our our collective work to make our collective li- lives, uh, I just you know, and and none of us are individuals. None of us have um, control over our lives. None of us should be proud of ourselves. And if none of us are individually the prime mover, who or what the hell is? Yeah, really. And so don't let anybody try to put you down and tell you that, you know, you shouldn't be proud of what you do. That's right. Because you should be. And you and uh, one of the things I wanted to um, before you get into that, one of the things I just wanted to say was, because um, when Robert told me, I <laughs> when he told me I'm going to talk about grit and perseverance, things like that, and I I thought about it and I thought, you know, there is one thing that I always have to remind myself because I, you know I get into these things, I get into the zone, I work really, really, really hard. And I get it done. Sometimes it's aggravating, and sometimes I'm, you know, it's 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 very difficult. And uh, time flies by, and then the day is over by six o'clock, and I'm like, what the heck did I just do <laughs> with my time? Amy's been working wicked hard this week. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, so sometimes I lose sight of of what I should value out of the experience of what I just bet I what I went what I went through where I really put my you know nose to the grindstone I really um, worked super hard and um, uh, I lose sight of the value of that of the value of that experience of the value of my work of what it means that I got whatever I got done um, of, of the um, uh, the connections between what I did to all the other things that are happening um, and I lose sight of that so I need to stop and, and really introspect sometimes and say yeah I had an aggravating day <laughs> but it was worth it because you know what without me doing this this and this and this wouldn't have been achieved and people wouldn't have known about this and, and people wouldn't have been inspired by this and people wouldn't have had that that experience that I'm offering them that actually betters their lives and makes their lives um, a flourishing kind of life. So yes, yeah, so I, I sometimes need to stop and remind myself because sometimes I think I'm a little too gritty. <laughs> hmm. I persevere a little bit too much and, um, and I lose sight of the value of what I'm doing. Um, Roger says, regarding grit, frustration is a a phase of creative thinking, even for geniuses, and blessed are those who can follow through. Yes. 
that's a, a lovely statement, Roger. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think you'll find the show notes have, have the references in the show notes have a lot of good tips and tricks. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things I will link to is the poetry of Burton Braley. Yeah. There used to be even more, I th- well, maybe there still are, motivational poets, not just motivational speakers. And fortunately, we have a lot of those these days, but motivational writers. If you're not familiar with Burton Braley, we first became familiar with him through the Atlantean Press. They published a book called Virtues in Verse, the poetry of Burton Braley. And if you read a few samples, and they're all available online now, this is from 100 years ago, um, you'll see what we mean. If you think we have time, I could read one real quick here. Please do. Probably is most famous, so those of you who know Braley will already know this. Success. If you want a thing bad enough to go out and fight for it, work day and night for it, give up your time and your peace and your sleep for it, if only desire of it makes you quite mad enough never to tire of it, makes you hold all other things tawdry and cheap for it, if life seems all empty and useless without it, and all that you scheme and you dream is about it, if gladly you'll sweat for it, fret for it, plan for it, lose all your terror of God or man for it, if you'll simply go after that thing you want with all your capacity, strength and sagacity, faith, hope and confidence, stern pertinacity, if neither cold poverty, famished and gaunt, nor sickness, nor pain of body or brain can turn you away from that thing that you want. If dogged and grim you besiege and beset it, you'll get it. Yay! So, Burton Braley has, has many, many works like that. Oh, very nice. Very um, motivational when your motivation might wane a bit. Yeah. Yes, you know, uh, we've got some comments here that are very nice. Um, Glenn says, got to write down goals, write out steps, and then follow through. Works for me. Get lots of things done that way. Making myself work, even when I feel like crap, usually gets me out of my crappy mood. Excellent. That's, and, that's, a, that's a theme of our show. Externalize, externalize, externalize. Yeah. If you are carrying write your, it down. If you're carrying your to-do lists in your head, or if you're doing your planning in your head, get it out <laughs> on paper. That changes everything and we also have david who says there is a phrase that wrestlers have maybe related to grit which is embrace the grind yes embracing the grind has always appealed to me when i need to persevere that's exactly right it's it's when we talk about ten thousand hours it sounds all floating but accepting that some things take a long time allows you to say well okay then I can get excited about the Monday through Friday, the 9 to 5, if I can see this is taking me where I want to go. Mm -hmm. Yes, embrace the grind, the daily grind. (laughs) Excellent. Especially if you're a a, a wrestler. (laughs) So my post-it note for the week, because every week we have a post-it note that you should put on your mirror or someplace you will see it every day. My post-it note just says grit equals passion plus perseverance. Nice. Just reading that reminds me to be as gritty as I can. And, you know, that passion part, I, that's what I was thinking about. You know, you've got to uh, tell yourself again and again why you're doing it. What, mm-hmm. What's at stake? What value are you trying to pursue? That's right. That's the, the passion. It's the what and the why. Mm-hmm. Hell yes. Heck yeah. So your homework for the week, because every week we have homework. What would the show be without takeaways? Take the quiz. The quiz. A quiz. Well, of course. Just like uh, when we talked about Gretchen Rubin, she had your, your the quiz for your your four. Um, I forgot the the four tendencies. Yes, four tendencies. And when we talked about the five love languages, there was the five love languages quiz. There is a quiz to take for grit. So, link in the show notes to the yeah. author's website where you can take her grit quiz, and then pick an area to target this week. For either improvement, reflection, or if no improvement is needed, celebration. And number two, listen to Ayn Rand's essay, The Money-Making Personality. If you haven't heard it yet, or you haven't heard it in a while, 
Mm-hmm. It's it's it gets me. It actually is one. It's one of those ones that chokes me up by the end every time. Well, most of what I internet does does that. Mm-hmm. So listen to that one. The link will be in the show notes. Uh, we've got a comment from uh, David who says um, David H this time. Smart. Uh, it's the um, the smart goals with two T's. Yes. Smart, measurable, attainal, attainable, relevant, time bound, and <laughs> thrilling for yes. grit. Yes, David That's adds awesome. thrilling. Yes, excellent. If I had homework, I if would. You had homework. I would tell everybody to to try to say challenge themselves by saying indomitable. Conscious, I'm sorry, indomitable conscientiousness, 10 times. Indomitable conscientiousness. Indomitable conscientiousness. 10 times fast. That's actually not too bad. It kind of rolls off the tongue. <laughs> we'll give that a shot. Yes. And with that said, mm-hmm. good Lord, look at the time. Oh, Quick reminders. Goodness. Oh, what is Show that? notes are extensive this week. There might even be items I didn't get to, but all of them are super valuable well worth the money that you paid to listen to this episode. So go to the show notes. They will be posted right after the episode wraps. They are extensive. This and past shows are, as always, available at youtube.com slash Robert yes. and facebook.com slash Robert Yes. And you can support this show without even spending any money mm. by sharing those episodes. Yes. By liking the shows on YouTube. You know, and By sh- subscribing mm. to our channel. Yeah, and share Robert's... Um, uh, uh, YouTube channel because they're yeah. all there. They're all conveniently they're all packaged for your convenience. <laughs> it's amazing. And a big thank you and shout out to our patrons. Yes. You, you motivate me. You you get me through. You get me gritty. It's great. If you <laughs> want to join our patrons, patreon.com slash Robert Naser. Patreon.com slash Robert Naser. Or support us directly. You can message me for a PayPal address. That's right. Thank you so much. And thank you for listening. You guys are just the best. You are the best audience. You know, and, you know, sort of stealthy and all, it's a surprise, but we're actually, Mm -hmm. they don't know it yet, but we are changing the world. Oh. (laughs) We were listening to Yaron Burke recently, and Uh he's got a number of initiatives going to change the world, to save the world from some of the stuff going on out there. Oh, yeah. And he's talked in the past about how, well, yeah, but you know what we need is a hundred different people out there talking about ideas. Mm-hmm. And there are so many good podcasts right now that are doing that. Yeah. From the Objective Standard to the so Grand many. Center UK to, I won't even try to name them all because I'll end up leaving somebody out. Right. But this show, we are happy to join that roster. Mm-hmm. The show is only going to get bigger yep. with the help of the amazing Quentin Linda Cordaire. Yes. We've got our number of subscribers over 100. We're going for 200 ASAP. Share the show. Help us out with that. We are changing the world, and you are doing it with us. So thank you so much. Oh, before we go, I just want to give a shout-out to the three winners of the Quentin Cordaire signed autographed books. That's uh, Kirk, Sher- Cherie, or Cherie, Cherie, and Alex. That's and right. Alex. So yep. congratulations to you three. That was great fun. Oh, the Cordaires are so cool. The Cordaires are just fantastic. Probably need to get them a link you... in our show notes again this week. Yeah. Cordaire.com. Go there, buy stuff. Buy or, stuff. Or QuentCordaire.com. Buy know, his writings. Uh, you know, those two interviews were so fantastic. Oh, and highlights. They were very different from each other. I wasn't entirely sure. Like, like oh, yeah, it'll be the same know, thing each time. But Lin- no, it was totally Linda different. Linda was so... Um, just effervescent and wonderful and um just so high-spirited enthusiastic and yeah um, and then with Quentin we went richer and deeper richer and deeper and very very contemplative and introspective and really got me thinking and it's really just lovely I just and we did a fine job talking to them too uh, yeah we did okay (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes, that was awesome. We will be doing more interviews in the future. Let us know in the notes, too, or in the comments, if you would like to see more interviews. Yes. And we will be reaching out to people. Da- David O. says, I love your show so much. Thank oh. you. I will be thinking how to Thank contribute you, that and is share. Awesome. Thank you very, very much. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, at this point, um, everything is, and anything is appreciated. We mm-hmm. love it. You are the best. So, yes. with that said. Yeah. As always, we do wish you success, and we wish you flourishing, and we wish you the passion and the perseverance 
to achieve all of your goals. Mm -hmm. And as always, we wish you love. Mm -hmm.